Well, as we turn to God's word, let's just pray and invite him to speak to us this morning. Jesus, we love you. And Jesus, as we begin to think about how to put you first in everything, would you open our minds and open our hearts? Give us a, a desire to put in the place the things we need to do in order to put you first in everything this morning. Would you speak to us, Holy Spirit, through the word of God this morning, through the letters written a long time ago, and show us the things that we need to change to be more like Jesus today. In your name we pray, amen. Do you like movies? I love movies. I mean, my favorite thing to do on a Friday is to grab Britain and either watch a movie in a movie theater or grab a pizza and watch a movie at home on Friday nights. And one of the movies that I've loved in my life is, it's actually an oldie because some of you weren't even alive when it came out back in the 90s, like Pastor Abby. She wasn't even born when it came out. Yeah, you weren't born when the movie came out. The movie that I'm talking about is City Slickers. Does anybody know that movie? <laughs> City Slickers. It's about this group of guys who start, start to experience a midlife crisis. And in this midlife crisis, they decide that they're going to do something fun. They're going to go to a dude ranch, and they're going to do a cattle drive. And so this group of three friends, they go to this cattle drive, and they begin to meet different cowboys. And they meet this one cowboy, Curly, who's this old, surly cowboy that just is kind of gruff and intimidating at times. And there's this one scene where Mitch, who's played by Billy Crystal, is riding alongside Curly. And he begins to tell Curly about what he's feeling, about what he's experiencing, how he's wondering why he was born, wondering what the purpose of his life is. Is there any significance to what he does? And he tells Curly this, and he says, what is the meaning of life? And Curly turns to him, and he holds up one finger, and he says, it's just one thing. And he captures Mitch's attention, and maybe he's captured your attention this morning. And, Cur and Mitch says to Curly, he goes, well, what is it? He goes, that's what you have to figure out. <laughs> and you know, this morning, I want to talk to you about this one thing. This one thing that I think all of us are searching for. This one thing that will change your life if you embrace it. I wanna to talk to you about this one thing that increases the level of happiness in our life, this one thing that can make a difference in our relationships, this one thing that will bring significance and meaning to our life. It's the one thing that we were born for. That's what I wanna to talk to you about today. You know, we are in this series that we've called Jesus First. We started it last week, and it's all about answering the question, are you putting Jesus first in everything? And in this series, we began out by talking about the why. Why do we need to put Jesus first? And in the first week, we said the reason that we have to put Jesus first is because he's already first. He's already first over all things. And your past, your present, and your future depend on you putting Jesus first. That's the why. Because he's already first in everything. And this week and in the weeks ahead, I wanna talk about what. What does it look like to put Jesus first in your life? And today, as we talk about the what, we're gonna look at the letter, Colossians, that we began reading last week. And we're gonna look at the story of one person, the author, a man by the name of Paul, and how his example gives us a picture of what it looks like to put Jesus first in everything. And here's what we're gonna learn from Paul today, and here's the thing I want you to know, that when you put Jesus first into everything, you discover the one thing that changes and compels you in everything. Let me explain why I say it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the letter to the Colossians, uh, the, what we call the book of Colossians. We're gonna look at Colossians 1, beginning at verse 24. And last week we learned that this is a letter that was written to a church. Now, when we talk about church, we're not talking about an institution or a building. We're talking about people, people like you and me. In fact, the people in Colossae, the city where this church is, they've gathered together and they're probably reading this, this letter out loud as a large group, just like we are today. And this group that is gathered together to worship Jesus doesn't know Paul. They've never met him. 
They began following Jesus through probably some people who Paul did lead to Christ, who began following Jesus because of, Christ, of Paul's example, but they've never met him. And this group of people, they're gathered together and they're seeking to learn how to put Jesus first in everything. And as we go to the passage that we're gonna talk about today, Paul begins with a very interesting statement. He says this, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. It's kind of an interesting statement. He talks about suffering, both his suffering, Paul's suffering, and the church's, or sorry, Jesus' suffering for the church. In order for us to understand what this statement, what Paul is saying in this statement, we have to understand what the suffering is that he's experiencing, what the suffering is that Jesus experienced for his church. Well, the suffering that Paul talks about, what does that look like? Well, as Paul writes this letter, what we need to understand is that he's writing it in jail. Uh, Paul is imprisoned a number of times throughout his life. He's imprisoned because of his faith, because he won't stop telling people about Jesus. And in the book of Acts, we see there's three major imprisonments that Paul goes through. We believe that it's the third one where he writes this letter. That he's sitting in a prison in Rome, writing to the church in Colossae. Now, if you've read the last seven chapters of the book of Acts, you know that Paul's imprisonment in Rome began first in Jerusalem. That he had been arrested for sharing his faith. Then he was put on trial again and again and until eventually he appeals to Caesar. Kind of like appealing to the Supreme Court today for you and for me. And Paul appeals to Caesar, which means that he gets transferred to Rome. And while he's in Rome, his imprisonment starts out in his own home. He rents a house where he's under house arrest. That doesn't sound too bad. Doesn't sound like suffering, does it? But we know in the last years that Paul's imprisonment actually moves from house arrest to actually being in a Roman jail. Now that sounds hard. But scholars don't think that's what Paul is talking about. We know from Paul's life that he suffered in other ways, not just the imprisonment. If he's not talking about that, maybe he's talking about the suffering that he endured in his life. You see, Paul, in the course of his life, because he wouldn't stop sharing his faith, he was beaten, he was whipped. People threw stones at him in order to try and kill him. In fact, scholars believe that he probably walked with a limp and he probably was hunched over because all of the abuse that he had taken because he would not stop sharing his faith. Is Paul talking about that suffering? Actually, scholars are in agreement that these aren't the type of suffering that he's talking about. So what is the suffering that Paul is talking about that he suffers in his body? Well, we'll come back to that in a second. Because to understand what Paul is talking about, we have to understand what he's talking about when it comes to the suffering of Jesus. When you hear the phrase, suffering of Jesus, what comes to mind? For me, when I hear the phrase suffering of Jesus, I think of Jesus' death on the cross. This excruciating pain that he endured on the cross when he died for the forgiveness of sins, for your sins and for mine. As scholars would say, that's not what Paul is talking about here. They, they would say that based on what follows, that what Paul is talking about when it comes to the suffering in Jesus includes that, but it's not all of that that what Paul is talking about is Jesus giving up all of his divine rights, all of his power and his privileges, and coming to earth. Living as a human like you and me, subject to all the pains that go through there, but even more than that, as Jesus carried out his mission, he was ridiculed and abused by religious leaders. That is part of the suffering of Christ. As Jesus went about his mission of freeing people and healing people and teaching people, he experienced physical, emotional, and even spiritual tiredness, exhaustion. That is part of the suffering that Jesus endured. The suffering that Paul is talking about here is everything that Jesus experienced in his mission to bring reconciliation between you and God. That is the suffering of Christ that Paul is talking about. It culminates with his death, his resurrection, and ascension, which proves that he is God and that we can be forgiven for the sins in our life. And Paul says that as he suffers in his body, that he's participating in the suffering of Christ. 
And what he's saying is that everything that Christ went through, everything that Christ went through in his mission to redeem the world, to reconcile the world with God, that Paul, in suffering, in the things that he does in his life, he is continuing on the mission of God. You see, Paul sees his life as an extension of Christ's life. And this is the first thing we learn about what it means to put Jesus first in everything. To put Jesus first in everything is to begin to realize that your life is an extension of Christ's. To put Jesus first in everything involves realizing that your life is an extension of Christ's in everything. Is that how you see your life? Or do you see you living your life and Jesus is just tacked on to it? Paul saw his life as a continuation of the life of Jesus, as a continuation of the mission of Jesus to reconcile the world to God. Is that how you see your life? Paul is so committed to this that he says this. He said, God has given me the responsibility, me, Paul, the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. Paul takes this so seriously. He sees his life as an extension of the mission and the work, the life of Jesus Christ in the world, that he says, it is my responsibility to proclaim the message, to make sure that everyone in the world knows about Jesus. This is his job. This is his life. This is his mission, and it's the continuation of Jesus's. He says this message was kept secret for centuries and generations past. Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and the church in Colossae was surrounded by people who had different worldviews, different faiths, different ways of seeing life, and one of the prevailing thoughts was that there was a secret that there was a secret, or in some translation it says mysteries, that there were secrets and mysteries that if you would just know these things, that you would have a great life, that you would find meaning and significance, that it would change your relationships, that you would be happy. Sound familiar? I think we have the same worldview and philosophy today, that it would just be, if we would just know the secret, if we would just know the mystery, that we would be happier. If we could just attain the secret, our relationships, our marriages would be better. If we could just understand the mysteries of the world, we would know what our significance, our meaning, the reason why we were born is. We still have this today. You can Google or go on Amazon and you can see all of the different philosophies that vie for your attention, believing that they have a secret. And there was these teachers in Colossae who believed that they had the secret. And Paul comes along and he says, this secret that everybody says they have actually has been revealed. This secret that everybody says they have that, that you just need to hold, that you need to have in order to experience happiness and health and good relationships and meaning in life, you can have it. It's actually been revealed. He says this. He says, for God wanted them all those people that are searching for the secret of life, the secret of meaning behind life. For God wanted them to know that the riches of glory of Christ are for you Gentiles. It's for you who are searching. It's for the people of Colossae. It's for you and me. That the, the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. The secret, Paul says, to life the secret to having a great life, the one thing, to put it in Curly's vernacular, is Christ in you. Christ in you. This is the secret to everything. This is what Paul discovered. And he says, this isn't some secret. God's freely revealed it for everyone. There's nothing hidden. It is Christ in you because as you embrace Christ, everything changes. The secret is that Jesus gave his life for you and for me. You see, from the moment that you and I were born, we were in rebellion with God. And rebellion always does one thing. It kills relationship. 
We've seen this. We know this. A rebellious teenager destroys the relationship with their parents. Maybe that's your story or maybe you know that because you were the rebellious teenager. We were born in rebellion. We destroyed our relationship with God, but Jesus, who is God himself, came to restore a relationship between you and God. This is the secret. And not only does he restore relationship, but he gives you his spirit. Holy Spirit to live within you so that God himself is within you. You're never alone. God is always with you. Christ in you makes all the difference. It makes all the difference, and Paul knows this personally. Listen to what he says. He says, so we tell each other, about Christ, we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given. We want to present them to to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Paul says, I struggle so hard because Christ is working in me. He's changing me. You see, Paul knows what happens when you put Jesus first in everything. He knows that putting Jesus first in everything changes everything in you. He knows this firsthand. You see, Paul didn't always tell people about Jesus. In fact, for probably half of his life, Paul was diametrically opposed to the teachings of Jesus. Paul was a religious person. He'd grown up with his own faith. And he became passionate about that faith. He was zealous for it. So zealous that he began defending that faith to anyone that opposed it. And so when Jesus' disciples begin spreading his way of living throughout Jerusalem, Paul becomes upset. So upset that he convinces the religious leaders that he should be allowed to go door to door, pulling people out of their homes and arresting them. It goes so far that Paul actually supervises the execution of one of the first Christians. This is how zealous Paul is for it, for his faith. But then he encounters Jesus. He encounters Jesus and everything changes. The zealousness that he had to stop the spread of the Christian faith went so far as to hurt people. But once he encounters Jesus, he's now so zealous about spreading the Christian faith and helping people follow Jesus. Paul knows that when Christ is in you, It changes everything. When you choose to put Jesus first in everything, everything changes. When you look at your life, your life before Jesus, is it different today than it was then? Or maybe you're like me and you became a follower of Jesus when you were just a kid. Probably a better question for you and me and really for anyone is your life with Jesus, is it the same today as it was a year ago? Because if it's the same today as it was a year ago, then you're not putting Jesus first in everything. Because Jesus is always changing you. He's always at work. Paul was significantly different than he was before he knew Jesus. So much so that he says, we can't stop telling people about Jesus. We have to tell them they need to know who he is. Paul has so significantly changed. Have you been changed by Jesus like that? I wonder if you haven't been changed because you haven't put Jesus first in everything. I think sometimes we live in fear of what it means that Jesus will change us into. I think sometimes we live in fear of Jesus changing us into Paul and look how that turned out. Roman prison, no thank you. I think sometimes we live in fear that, you know, Jesus will change us into that person who we kind of admire because they really have an on-fire faith, but at the same time, they're kind of weird. Anybody know any weird Christians? I think sometimes we live in fear of what Jesus will change us into. Friends, here's what I want you to know. Jesus changed Paul. That's what we see in this passage. We see a man who is incredibly on fire, but he wasn't always that way. He's incredibly on fire for his faith. But you see, Paul was always on fire. (laughs) He was always zealous. Before he knew Jesus, he was zealous for the wrong thing. 
Once he came to know Jesus, the zeal that he had just intensified. You see, the zeal that was there had been corrupted by sin, but Jesus comes along and he strips off all of the corruption. And the zealousness that Paul has is reshaped in a different direction. And here's what you need to know. That when you begin to put Jesus first in everything, he'll change you in everything. Doesn't mean you're gonna become like Paul. Doesn't gonna be, mean you're gonna become like that person that you admire that maybe mm, that's a little much. You see, what Jesus does is he changes you. He strips off all that sin has corrupted within you, all that sin has damaged within you, and he makes you into the person he created you to be. He makes you weird in your own way. This is what it means to put Jesus first in everything, is to be changed into the person that Jesus always envisioned you to be. And so we don't have to live in fear of what that change looks like, because the God who created you has something amazing for you, just as he did for Paul, just as he did for countless other people. So maybe it's time to put him first in everything. Paul continues, he says this, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you. Some translations use the word contended for you. I want you to know how much I have agonized, contended for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. Remember Paul's in prison? How has he agonized? How has he contended for the church in Colossae? How has he agonized? How has he contended for the church in Laodicea? He's in prison. Prison, he's never been there. What is he talking about? Paul is contending for these people in prayer. He is praying for them again and again in agonizing, so much it's agonizing that he is just so committed to praying for them. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think our prayers actually aren't like that at all. We may contend for people, but they're people we know or people that influence our lives, right? Or we contend for ourselves. Let's just put it that way, right? Am I right? Am I the only one that does that? Sometimes we do this. Yet Paul is so changed that he agonizes for people he never met. He contends for people that he, pro he will never meet on earth. Tell me, do you contend for people like that? Do you agonize for people like that? Paul is in prison. He says, I want them to be encouraged and, and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is in prison for his faith. And he won't stop praying for people. He won't stop writing letters. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was in prison, I might start a letter writing campaign but it would be to get me out of prison. But Paul spends all of his time praying for people, writing to people saying, this is how you follow Jesus. Not saying, get me out of prison. You see, Paul is so changed by Jesus that he's compelled by one thing, the love of Christ. He says, I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. I rejoice that you're living as you should, that your faith is strong in Christ. He says, my heart is with you. See, Paul's whole life is compelled by love. Before he knew Jesus, his whole life was compelled by hate, by distrust, by the things of this world. But Paul is so changed by his encounter with Jesus that his life is now compelled by something different. You see, to put Jesus first in everything is to allow the love of Christ to compel you in everything. Have you experienced this? Have you ever been compelled by love? Back in 2019, my youngest daughter, her name's Emma, my youngest daughter was in university, she's 19 at this point, and she begins to work on mom and dad for a dog. 
Okay, we had talked about having a dog for many years, but it just didn't fit with our lifestyle because dogs are a lot of work, right? I mean, they're like having a kid that never grows up. But we have this 19-year-old girl who's in university and on the cusp of being launched out into her own life, right? We have two other kids. We got rid of them. (laughs) We got one left, and this one wants a dog. But the thing is, I know, I know how it's gonna work. She's gonna move out, start her life, and we're gonna be stuck with the dog and the cat that she talked us into. (laughs) And so she begins working on her mom and me to get a dog, and I say, no. She starts working on her mom, because mom's a little softer than dad, and she just keeps probing and probing and saying, mom, we should get a dog, mom, we should get a dog, and and my wife begins to say, we should get a dog. (laughs) And I said, honey, do you remember all the plans we have? Because we were on the Freedom 50 plan, you know? The Freedom from Kids 50 at 50 plan. And we were gonna travel, we were gonna do these amazing things, we were gonna have no responsibility, and a dog is a lot of responsibility. And my daughter is working on my, on my wife, and my wife begins to say, we should get a dog. And I'm like, no, no. Christmas comes along. They start going to the Humane Society every day. <laughs> you know, saying, look at this. They start sending me texts with pictures of dogs. And I'm like, nope, nope, not gonna do it, right? And then one day I wake up, and I have this thought. And it was, if the woman that I love wants a dog, why am I saying no? We had a dog three days later. (laughs) We still have a dog. (laughs) Because the woman that I love wants a dog. And it compels me to do things. Paul is compelled to write letters from a prison cell, to spend agonizing hours in prayer, to travel the world telling people about Jesus because he's compelled by the love of Jesus. Have you ever been compelled by the love of Jesus? You see, Paul is changed by the love of Jesus. Paul sees his life as an extension of the life of Jesus because of the love of Jesus. You see, the one thing, the one thing, the mystery, the secret that all of us are seeking for, the one thing that will change our lives completely is the love of Jesus. It is the mystery. It's a mystery because you and I were born in rebellion with God. We destroyed the relationship We've continued to do it throughout our whole life. And yet God himself steps into the world to restore relationship. Paul, in another letter to the church in Rome, he says that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in rebellion, Christ dies for us. This is the love of Christ. That even though you broke your life, he wants to redeem it. He wants to restore it. This is the mystery, that God would love us so much that he would pursue us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our rebellion. God is pursuing you. And when you accept this love, it changes everything. And we put Jesus first in everything as a response to him putting us first. What does it look like to put Jesus first in everything? Responding to his love. Letting his love change us, letting his love compel us, and making our life about his love. So how do we respond to this? What should we do as a result of the love of Christ? You know, maybe you're here today, and this is the first time you've ever heard about Jesus, or maybe it's the first time you've ever heard someone talk about being born in rebellion and God restoring and seeking you and wanting to be in relationship with you. The first thing to do is to accept the love of God, the love of Jesus in your life. Have you done that? We'd love to help you do that. Pastor Abby and I are gonna be here after the service And if you haven't accepted the love of Jesus, which is the starting point, just realizing how much he loves you and responding to that. If you haven't done that, come and talk with me and Abby. We'd love to help you get started on your relationship with Jesus. But maybe you did this a a long time ago. Maybe you've been following Jesus for some time. So how do we respond to Paul's example of putting Jesus first in everything? I think putting Jesus first in everything is about responding to the love of Jesus. And I think it, it... is about answering a simple question. The question is this, what does Jesus' love require of me? 
What does Jesus' love require of me right now in this situation? What does Jesus' love require of me at work tomorrow? What does Jesus' love require of me in my relationship with my spouse or with my kids or with my neighbor? What does Jesus' love require of me? And then doing whatever it is that Jesus' love compels you to do. As we do this, we begin to put Jesus first in everything. The starting point, what does love require of you? And we aren't always gonna get this right. We're gonna, we're gonna mess it up at times. I, I did this morning. I get to pick up the donuts that we sell at Fresh Ground every Sunday, and I went to Tim Hortons, and the person behind the counter was not the sweetest person in the world, and I was not the sweetest person in the world back. <laughs> and as I was walking out, I heard Jesus say, what are you preaching on today? I'm like, yeah. What does Jesus' love require of me? See, Jesus doesn't say that to me or to you to, to cause us to feel bad, but to realize that we have a chance to change things and we to respond differently next time. And he forgives us and he walks with us and he says, what does my love require of you in this situation? And I think that we need to go through this week asking this question again and again and again. As we go out of the church parking lot and somebody cuts us off, we need to say, what does love require of me? As we go home and maybe somebody wants us to do something when there's a game on and we need to say, what does love require of me? We need to respond differently. And as we do, we begin to put Jesus first in everything because his love begins to change us. His love begins to make us realize that our lives are an extension of his. The happiness that you're looking for is found in Jesus. The relationship can be redeemed and healed through Jesus. You can find meaning and purpose and significance in your life no matter what you do in Jesus. You were born to experience the love of Jesus. This is the one thing. What does love require of you today? I wonder what it would look like if the church of St. Albert would begin to take Jesus seriously in this if we would begin to be compelled by the love of Jesus, if we would begin to be changed by the love of Jesus, if we began to ask the question, what does love require of me? I wonder how it might impact our city. I wonder how it might impact the capital region. I think we'd start to see relationships change, marriages healed, I think we would see the incidences of domestic abuse begin to drop as spouses began to take Jesus seriously and allow his love to transform them and change the way they respond to each other. I think we would see homelessness and poverty eradicated in our lifetime because a group of people took Jesus seriously and allowed his love to compel them to respond with love to everything. I think the uncivility in our world would drastically change if Christians would actually ask, what does Jesus require of me, not what are my rights? I think the children who are struggling, not flourishing, would be loved and cherished like Jesus did with them. As families open their houses to become foster parents and to adopt children, what does love require of you? I think, I think that our world would be drastically different if the people of Jesus would actually ask that question and then do what Jesus requires of them, which is to lead with love. Do you want to do that? Do you want to see those things happen? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And I confess 
I think some of my friends confess with, the, with me that we haven't gotten it right. And we've led with things other than your love. And today, Jesus, we commit ourselves to asking the question, what does your love require of us? And then responding appropriately. Jesus, we want your love to change us. We want your love to change us in such a way that we see our lives as an extension of your life, our lives as an extension of your mission, our lives as an extension of your love. Oh, Jesus, help us to do this, we pray. Amen.